Susan Wright, the ultimate suburban woman. She was always giving me cleaning tips. Married to the ultimate suburban man. He was the number one salesman. The Wrights were living the American dream. Lots of people would describe him as a normal, healthy, happy relationship. But this picket fence fairy tale had more than a few dirty little secrets. He had hooked up with an ex-girlfriend, had three-way sex. Secrets that would be unveiled with the discovery of a body in the backyard. The American dream becomes the ultimate American nightmare next on SNAP. From the new carpeting in the living room to the freshly cut lawn out front, Susan Wright had made it. She was far from rich, but her tidy, middle-class suburban home looked like the ultimate expression of her childhood dreams. Susan tried to be the perfect wife. All she ever wanted to be was a wife and a mother. Born in 1976, Susan Weiss grew up in a small town just outside of Houston, Texas. Quiet and shy in high school, Susan preferred quiet nights in to rowdy nights out. Uh, our family was great. In high school, uh, I didn't play sports. I spent a lot of time at home um, watching movies with my mom. Susan might have been a home buddy, but the pretty 18-year-old dreamed of one day spreading her wings. She moved out of her house when she was pretty young, went to community college for a little bit, and worked in a hair salon. But a degree in cosmetology wasn't exactly what Susan had in mind. She had bigger plans than that. Susan wanted to go to school to be a nurse. That was what she wanted to do. She was trying to make money, go to school. Between work, school, and bills, Susan had little time for a love life. But a beach trip to Galveston with some friends in 1997 would change that. He drove up um, in his truck. He hit it off with my best friend's husband really well. I didn't talk to him at all. Um, but when I got in my car to leave, I noticed that his business card was on the windshield. He seemed really nice. so. Um, I called him and asked him to uh, dinner. In spite of their seven-year age difference, Susan fell hard for gregarious 28-year-old Jeff Wright. He was really charming. He was very sweet. He wanted to see me all the time. I thought he was too old for me, but uh, as time went by, he was just so sweet and attentive, it didn't seem to matter. That discrepancy of about eight or nine years is um, probably pretty common for girls who are teenagers or, you know, around 20 because they seek a man who is more mature and most men reach somewhat more maturity around the age of 28. Jeff Wright was mature enough to realize that he'd found someone truly special. He had told me that he'd found a girl who was the one. This was the one he was going to marry. This was going to be the wife of his kids. He was ecstatic. And Susan happened to step into the hard living bachelor's life at just the right time. When Jeff and I would party, uh, Anything went, I mean, uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, partying for days at a time, no sleep. Um, it was just completely out of control. Jeff said that Susan pretty much had saved his life, that she pretty much straightened, straightened his idea of where he wanted to be in life. He didn't want to be out running around drinking, partying. He wanted to be home. He wanted to have a family. And he didn't have to wait long. Several months after they started dating, Susan dropped a bombshell. I think that when he found out that she was pregnant, that he wanted to do the right thing, and that he loved her. Uh, I don't think that he was necessarily ready at that point to be a father, but those things, you know, they, they just, they come along, and he grew into that situation, I think, quite well. He'd have to get ready in a hurry. By the time he'd made his proposal in October of 1998, Susan was more than just a little pregnant. I was um, eight months pregnant with m my son, and we were in the truck, and he handed me the ring and said, will you marry me? So I said yes. It was Texas-style romance. Two weeks later, Susan said yes again, this time at a private wedding ceremony held outside of Houston. The blushing bride and proud groom commemorated the event with a big steak dinner. Their wedding night was spent at the Outback Steakhouse. You know, I think that uh, that's probably not what either of them had uh, envisioned it would be. Maybe not, but the rights couldn't have been happier. I think they did look adoringly, both to each other. They hugged, they were affectionate, um, they held hands. I thought it was a very good relationship. Following the birth of their son Bradley in November, the young couple bought a fixer-upper in a suburb of northwest Houston. With Jeff's job selling flooring, the time seemed right to settle in. Berry Tree is a neighborhood made up of homes that were Built in the 80s, uh, 
not big homes, 12, 13, 1400 square feet. Susan quickly turned the track house into a real home. The house was a typical middle class all American house, clean, pretty neat, kids toys around, pictures on the fridge, all that. In 2001, the Wrights little house got a whole lot cozier following the birth of their second child, a beautiful baby girl named Kaylee. Jeff was so proud of, of his wife and kids, especially after Kaylee was born. With Jeff out pushing laminated hardwood flooring and linoleum tiles, Susan did her best to keep the home fires burning. They were more of a traditional family. He was the one who went out and worked. She stayed home to take care of the house and the kids and had dinner on the table when he came home. Women in our society, like Susan, are indoctrinated into this whole sense of perfection. They want to see themselves as this sort of Madonna character, the perfect mom, you know, the perfect wife. And it was very important for her to be that good girl that society and her family expected of her. If that perfection took a toll on Susan, neither her friends nor neighbors could see it. She was always giving me cleaning tips and cooking tips and how to get the baseboards clean and how to whip up this great three-course meal in 20 minutes. I would react like, I've got two small kids. It's not happening in my world. And she managed to do it all. By 1999, the Wrights had notched out a nice life for themselves. I think they were doing pretty good. I wouldn't say that they were rich. Jeff had a pretty decent truck. Susan had a nice car. There was even talk of building a new house for their growing family. He was making good money and uh, in fact was planning on building a new house and at the time shopping for a new car for his wife. Just shy of their five-year anniversary, the young couple looked to be on the verge of moving up in the world. But before they could break ground on a new house, an investigation would have cops doing a little digging of their own in the Wright's backyard. By 2002, Susan and Jeff Wright had been married for over four years. They had two beautiful children, a nice house in the Burbs, and a growing bank account. To friends and family, the Wrights seemed to have it all. Everyone described it as um, leave it to Beaver. And that's how I worked really hard to make things look that everything was perfect. But that all changed on the morning of January 15, 2003, when Susan Wright walked into the Domestic Violence Division of the Harris County Police Department. Accompanied by her mother, Susan claimed that Jeff had been abusing both her and drugs for years. But things had come to a head two days earlier when she finally confronted him about his problem. I told him that I loved him, but that he needed to get help. And I would stand by him if he got help, but if not, that I was going to leave. Susan said that he got mad. He ran up to her and grabbed her by her wrist and shoved her into the wall, screaming at her and just violently shaking her and, and slamming her into the wall during the entire time, then left the house. And Jeff hadn't been seen since. Unable to locate Jeff and concerned for Susan's welfare, Deputy Hall rushed an arrest warrant through the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Susan appeared to be a, a victim of domestic violence. That's what I, I perceived at the time. Um, she was very tearful, crying a lot, um, acted extremely afraid of Jeff returning home. As police began their search for Jeff Wright, friends and family grew increasingly anxious about his whereabouts. He'd call his cell phone and it would go directly to voicemail. I thought that was very unusual because Jeff liked his job and we were concerned at this point that um, Jeff may, may have been in trouble. But what bothered me is, A, he didn't call on our anniversary, which he was attentive to dates, and uh, his truck was still in the driveway. On January 18th, just three days after Susan filed her complaint, attorney Neil Davis arrived at the sheriff's office. He told them he had a new client and that he knew where to find Jeff Wright. I gave a very limited amount of information, just explaining that there was a body at a certain location, uh, that I was not personally involved in any way, uh, and to give them my business card. Following up on attorney Neil Davis's lead, police descended on the Wright's house on Berry Tree Drive. Neighbors watched in disbelief. I was watching TV, and there was a police officer that showed up in front of Jeff's house, and the police officer informed us that there might be a dead person in there. I was amazed. Entering the Wright's home, one room in particular caught the cop's attention, the master bedroom. The bed was partially disassembled. Mattress and box springs had been taken out of the room. 
uh, the carpet where the bed had been located was partially cut out. Um, one of the walls above where the bed had been had been freshly painted. But police made an even more gruesome discovery just outside the Wright's bedroom door. There's a small area, a couple feet wide, uh, towards the front of the residence that was just dirt. And that's where his body ultimately was discovered, uh, face down, uh, mostly buried. The back of the head, uh, the left shoulder, and the left arm was exposed. He was face down in the dirt. Once the entire back side of the body had been exposed, I had seen two injuries, clearly stab wounds. As for their chief suspect, well, it didn't take long for the cops to whittle down the list. Women, when they uh, commit spousal murder, tend to use a knife. They are three to four times more likely to use a knife than a man would. We figured the defendant was going to be Susan Wright because she was the only other grown-up living there. But attorney Neil Davis was making it very tough for the cops to get to his new client, Susan Wright. He claimed she was in a psychiatric hospital and unable to be questioned. They played this game for a whole week of telling me every day, Kelly, we'll give you a statement, we'll give you a statement. It's all about self-defense. The prosecution felt the crime scene told a different story. On January 23rd of 2003, they stopped waiting for a statement. They charged Susan with the murder of her husband and told her attorney to bring her in. But she didn't spend long in jail. She spent the weekend in jail and then she made her bond that following Monday. Maintaining Susan's freedom was now in the hands of her smooth-talking attorney, Neil Davis. But what Davis didn't know was that a dirty little secret from his sweet-faced client's past was about to come back to haunt them both. Susan Wright, devoted mother and housewife, faced a prison term of up to 99 years if convicted for the murder of her husband. Susan didn't deny stabbing her husband to death, but she claimed it was an act of self-defense. Before her trial even began, her attorney started laying the groundwork for her defense, which mostly involved Jeff Wright's character. Susan's attorneys very much sort of felt that uh, the court of public opinion would be very important, and they immediately began to portray her husband as this abusive, drug-crazed misogynist. But as the trial got underway in February 2004, it was clear that slamming Jeff's character wasn't going to be enough. In their opening arguments, the prosecution laid out a damning list of physical evidence. To begin, they claimed that Jeff hadn't just been stabbed a couple of times. He'd been stabbed a lot, like 193 times. People were shocked. They couldn't imagine that such a pretty young thing, stabbing her husband 193 times. Women kill for a number of different reasons, and one of them is revenge. And I think stabbing somebody 193 times is what we call overkill. It means that you're not just killing, you're not just stabbing somebody to kill them. You're stabbing them to show them that you are angry. But it wasn't just the number of wounds that called Susan's self-defense plea into question. It was also the manner in which they had been delivered. According to the medical examiner, the marks around Jeff's wrists and ankles indicated that he wasn't attacking Susan when he was stabbed. He was lying on his back tied to the bed. Mr. Wright was tied down and stabbed to death. He had ligatures on his arms, on his legs, and of all of his 193 plus stab wounds, only two of those were on the back, which again suggests that he was tied down and incapacitated while the injuries were being inflicted. But according to the defense, the number of wounds indicated that Susan was delusional from years of abuse. They had to use the battered wife defense to get to that many stab wounds. They had to set up a scenario to justify being in fear for her life, to justify having a knife in her hand and stabbing Jeffrey that many times. The defense also claimed the marks on Jeff's wrists were caused by Susan tying his hands to drag his 250-pound body to the hole in the backyard. She was clearly out of her mind and uh, she was delusional and she thought he was alive she stabbed him threw him in the, in the hole thought he was still alive so she began cleaning everything up manically thinking that he was going to beat her if he didn't clean the house and the defense argued they had the evidence to back up their claim jeff ha did have a prior charge he had been charged before in austin i believe it was for a, uh, a simple assault it was with a uh, a girlfriend at the time 
Lead prosecutor Kelly Siegler painted a different scenario. If Susan had been a longtime victim of abuse, she argued, why had she waited until the morning of January 15th to report it? Two days after she had killed Jeff. We could find no documentation uh, where Susan had ever made any reports to the police about any kind of uh, physical abuse in the family. But the defense maintained that such instances weren't uncommon. If they go to the hospital and a doctor sees an abused woman, the woman is going to be fearful that the doctor will contact authorities and that's going to lead to more uh, abuse. True, but the prosecutors reminded the jury that this case centered on the issue of self-defense and the facts surrounding the crime seemed to indicate something else. Premeditated murder. The prosecution contended that Susan Wright had lured her husband to bed that evening using the best weapon she had in her arsenal, her body. Around 9 o'clock, she brought Jeff into the bedroom, lit the candles, undressed herself, undressed Jeff, began to make love to him. She tied him up with his neckties, as tight as she could possibly tie him. She pulled the knife out and started to stab him. And the prosecution brought out the Wright's actual bed to illustrate their point. Are these the pieces recovered from the scene on Barry Street Road? Yes, ma'am. Certainly the most sensational moment was when Kelly Sigler straddled her assistant district attorney to demonstrate how this could have happened. Susan denied the state's assertion. That wasn't in our relationship at all. I think it's disgusting. She just acted so, so offended that, you know, how dare I suggest that, that she would basically do anything besides regular, boring, missionary sex. And it's like, come on, lady, you got handcuffs in the drawer. To back up their claim that there was more to Miss Prim and Proper than meets the eye, the prosecution revealed a juicy chapter from Susan's past. One that suggested this innocent housewife wasn't quite so innocent. Susan worked as a dancer at a gentleman's club for eight weeks on Saturdays. Susan naturally downplayed it. When I was 18, um, right outside of high school, I wanted to make money to go away to college. I, I danced for two months and I didn't like it, so I quit. Many young women that I talk to in my practice, if they come from a very religious background, many of them have views of sex, that sexuality is very bad or negative. And in rebellion of that, they go out and they look for um, ways to express their sexuality. Could possibly be through prostitution, but also so through topless dancing or just exploring their bodies in ways that would be very much the opposite of how they grew up. Whatever Susan's reasons for taking it all off, the prosecution seemed to have scored a point with the revelation. I think it helped the prosecution, the fact that she had been a topless dancer, because she would often act prude, and Kelly would say things like, you danced naked for men. But all of the prosecution's arguments begged one big question. If Susan didn't kill her husband in self-defense, then why did she kill him? The answer was a bigger surprise than the stripping, and revealed that Susan had more than one reason to want her husband dead. Susan had called uh, Jeff and uh, they began discussing an insurance policy that, uh, that Jeff had with our company. Jeff uh, said, said, don't worry, honey, if I die, you're going to be a very rich woman. Rich might have been an overstatement, but Susan did stand to inherit $200,000 upon Jeff's death. It was enough money, prosecutors contended, for Susan to start a new life for herself. Thank you. Please be seated. On March 3rd, the trial drew to a close. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, when the jury retired on March 4th, it took them only five hours to reach a verdict. They found Susan Wright guilty of second-degree murder for the death of her husband. I believe the jury, based on what they sentenced Ms. Wright to, obviously believed that there was some validity to what she was saying. And there's an old saying at the courthouse, you play the cards you're dealt. Uh, the prosecution was dealt the better hand. After her conviction, Susan was sentenced to 25 years at the William P. Hobby Correctional Facility. Many women in our society, like Susan, are brought up to be perfect, to be good homemakers, um, to be kind, and to be gentle, and to seemingly have this perfect life. She wanted to see her life as perfect as everything in its place. And what she finds out later on in her marriage is it's not coming true for her.
For beautiful Russian emigre Alina Kalichis, America was a dream come true. She was like a kid in a candy store. She had a millionaire husband. She used to call him her big teddy bear. And more money than she could spend. She shopped in the stores, Saks Fifth Avenue. She bought things in Tiffany's. Money was not any object, period. But when the body of Elena's big teddy bear washed up in a barrel, her American dream became a nightmare. A twisted tale of sex, betrayal, and cold-blooded murder. Next on Snapped. Elena was born poor in Moscow in 1966. Her childhood was difficult, to say the least. Mother was a drug addict, was not a, 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 a healthy home life. Later on in life, someone that would be in this situation would maybe be willing to do more to get what they need or, or sort of look out for themselves primarily rather than maybe other people. But even under such dismal circumstances, Elena had high hopes. As a young woman trying to make ends meet in Moscow, she met Boris Kalichis. She was 17. He was 34. His nickname was Wild Board. He was a nice, uh, outgoing, uh, heavyset big guy. Boris was a wealthy oligarch, one of Russia's emerging capitalists. He was making a fortune in aviation fuel. We started going together since then. I don't remember myself without him. I was absolutely shocked. Absolutely shocked. I've never met a man like this in my life. Me away. Someone who grows up in a situation similar to hers, um, you know, may, may be attracted to someone who is older, well-established. Boris left his wife and son and moved in with Elena. Life should have been good for the new couple, but Boris's business was dangerous. That was a very dangerous business in Russia. He had eight partners. All of them were killed um, by mobsters. Elena and Boris decided they'd be safer if they left Russia. They went to Poland for a time and eventually came to the United States. In 1992, Elena and Boris moved into the tightly knit Russian immigrant community of Brighton Beach in Brooklyn, New York. It was on April 16, 1992. I remember I had a beautiful apartment and everything was so, so, so perfect. So I think it was just a time to have a baby. My child was born on June 5th. 1992. Boris was thrilled with his new son. He was so happy running around telling everybody that, that finally we have a boy. Then he bought him a huge, huge monkey. I said that he's never going to be afraid at night. That's going to be his friend. He loved him to death. And he was just as thrilled two years later when Elena gave birth to a daughter, Sonia. Kids were devoted to her mother, but they also loved the father because he doted on they were a happy, happy family. With two growing children, Elena and Boris needed more space. And I love Manhattan. I want to be close to Manhattan. So I was picking and choosing all the areas. And then we found the Toad Hill area on the Staten Island, which looked very good to us. It was perfect. It was close to everywhere. And they had a beautiful school over there. And quiet, secure. And expensive. But that was no problem. Boris paid cash for the 9,000 square foot mansion on East Loop Road. It had uh, an indoor uh, heated swimming pool, garage, you know, uh, nice um, grounds. And she totally gutted it and had the whole thing redone. The poor little girl from Moscow had become a wealthy New Yorker with a vengeance. She was just like a kid in a candy store. She spent her money lavishly, never gave a second thought to cost of anything. Someone like this, their their self-esteem may be lower and, and who they are is defined by the amount of money they have or, or their sort of social status. And so demonstrating that to everyone else is important so everyone else knows, you know, that, you know, I'm not that poor girl anymore. Life was better than Elena ever thought it could be. There was just one problem. Boris's business kept him in Russia three weeks out of every month was very dangerous. I feared, did I ever fear, every day, every minute, every second. And on top of it, he was flying twice a month, four times a month. Elena wasn't just worried. 
She was lonely. She missed him a great deal. And, um, but he was very busy making money. And so that was kind of, she was torn between wanting to have the money and wanting to have her husband with her and wanting her family. So when Boris was around, she always tried to make the most of it. Like in the spring of 1992, when she and Boris and the two kids planned to go on the ultimate family vacation, a trip to Disney World. But this trip would be different. And when Elena returned, she would find herself in a never-never land of cops, con men, and killer conspiracies. After only eight years in America, Russian immigrants Elena Kalichis and her husband Boris were the envy of their upscale Staten Island neighbors. You know, there was a husband, wife, two young children. The, the husband was making uh, a lot of money, and uh, they had a nice house. Elena and Boris felt as if they've achieved uh, the pinnacle of success. And in March of 2000, the whole family was supposed to go for the pinnacle of American vacations, a week at Disney World. Only Boris didn't join them, which actually wasn't that strange. Elena didn't find it strange that Boris wasn't around. It often happened that he would return to Russia. When the family returned on March 31st, there was still no sign of Boris. Days went by, and when Boris still didn't surface, his brother Alexander became alarmed. We were usually in touch with each other, but he, I think, checked with Moscow, and Moscow said, no, no, Boris isn't back. He left and never came back. Then on April 2nd, a very drunk Elena Kaliches entered the Staten Island police station. She told officers that her husband was missing. She had any idea what might have happened to him. He, uh, up until it, including uh, might be, uh, that the fact he might still be in Russia. Her story was that uh, she didn't know where he was. Gee, dear Boris is probably off to Moscow. But Elena did say she'd had a fight with Boris just before their trip to Disney World. She admitted the fact that they were, uh, you know, they were speaking about divorce, a concern that uh, he was going to ruin her financially. That same day, the police got a surprise phone call from a man named Messiah Justice. Mr. Justice claimed to know Elena very, very well. The first uh, day after we spoke with Elena, uh, we spoke to Messiah Justice on the phone. And he freely admitted to having a relationship with Elena. In fact, he'd met Elena two years before Boris disappeared. I met Messiah in... 1999, and the end of October, I got lost in downtown Manhattan. There was a Mercedes uh, Jeep next to me. He gave her his card, and she said she called him. And they had uh, begun discussing this business about designer clothes, that perhaps she could have her own line of just designer clothes. But Messiah didn't just want to dress Elena. He wanted to undress her. He told her that she was beautiful, couldn't understand how her husband could leave her. And she was very vulnerable at the time. And she believed everything he had to say. With Boris absent most of the time, Messiah's style quickly won over the fashion-conscious and lonely Russian. And I closed my eyes on everything. I just wanted to help that guy. He came in flattering her, you know, telling her how beautiful she is and how exciting her life is, and really sort of solidified these things that she was insecure about. At first, Elena and Messiah met in hotels in New York City. But since Boris was gone three weeks a month, it was a lot more convenient to just stay home. Messiah basically moved in to, in the bedroom with Elena. There was no hiding it from the children that uh, this was her boyfriend. When people exhibit the kind of behavior where they'll invite their lover into the house when their children are still there, it could be that they are, on some level, they want their significant other, their husband, to know. Clearly, on some level, it would bother him that another man was in his house, in his bed, while his children were there. And this is a huge form of revenge, and it's a huge form of making him really angry. It sure did. When Boris found out, Elena's teddy bear became a wild boar. He was screaming uh, so loud. He was talking on the phone with her. And uh, fortunately, they spoke in Russian, so uh, the half of the curses used was not understood in the office. I think he was planning her, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, her divorce. That would certainly explain the fight. But it didn't explain why Boris missed the trip to Disney World and why he hadn't been heard from since. The answer to that question came on April 25th. 
That morning, a couple of kids in Queens made a grisly discovery. They found Boris's body floating uh, in a cardboard barrel in a marshy area uh, in an inlet off the Jamaica Bay. The body was wrapped in towels, sheets, and blankets. Medical examiner um, indicated that uh, Boris uh, was killed by a single shot uh, to the back of his head. What had been a missing person case was now a homicide. The first thing the cops did was haul Messiah Justice in. When they ran a background check, it turned out that Justice wasn't just a wannabe designer. Messiah's uh, criminal record indicated he was somewhat of a, of a con man. He did have um, other you know, convictions that would indicate uh, he was a bit of a con man. And now he seemed to be involved in something much more serious than a simple con. They said to him, listen, you want to go for murder, murder too? He said, not me. I didn't do it. And everything, whatever he knew, came up. Luckily, Messiah Justice was happy to be of assistance. He agreed to tell the cops everything. He indicated that Delane admitted to uh, killing Boris and uh, asked him to help get rid of the body. Uh, they bought a cardboard barrel, stuffed it in the barrel, and then uh, drove out um, to an inlet in Jamaica Bay, and he dumped it. It was a nice story. When the cops brought Elena in for questioning, she claimed it was nonsense. Boris was that treasure I actually needed. Because without him, it wouldn't be no money. It wouldn't be no good life. It wouldn't be no father for my kids. According to Elena, if either of them had motive to kill Boris, it was Messiah. He found out that I told my husband about him. He also knew that my husband is a very powerful man, and he would destroy him. With Boris out of the picture, you could have the woman, the house, the money, everything. It was a classic case of he said, she said. Unfortunately for Elena, the cops believed Messiah. We felt that uh, there was a lot of motive for him to, uh, to want to get rid of uh, Boris. He was able to enjoy, uh, you know, three quarters of the time. He was able to live in his house, drive his cars, you know, uh, sleep with his wife. On May 5th, 2000, the NYPD showed up at the Caliches mansion with a search warrant and an arrest warrant. Detectives went to her house and brought her in. She was intoxicated at the time. Uh, she was uh, very um, unemotional about the um, about this uh, her arrest. Messiah Justice was released without bail. While Elena sat in jail awaiting trial, both sides worked feverishly to build their cases. But no matter how hard they worked, it was all going to come down to the simple question of who a jury would believe. The beautiful Russian immigre or the gigolo con man? The state of New York versus Elena Kalichis opened June 6, 2002 in Staten Island. Elena's lover, a con man named Messiah Justice, had fingered her for the crime. When the trial opened, the prosecution lost no time in painting Elena as an immoral, cheating gold digger. Bored with her older, overweight husband, the state claimed that she was ready to move on. The ADA said, I remember because I was so offended by it that uh, Elena didn't need Boris. He was old and fat and ugly. And that's why she killed him. They claimed she had killed him and then headed off to Disney World for a little vacation. In their opening remarks, the defense freely admitted that Elena was no saint. I told this jury, this woman will not win Mother of the Year. She's not the most faithful, loyal spouse. She had an affair openly in her home with a younger black man and that affair continued even in the presence of her children. It does not mean Elena Kali just murdered her husband. The prosecution claimed that in this case it did. They put on witnesses who testified that Boris had been threatening to divorce Elena and leave her penniless as a result of the affair. There was conversations between herself and Boris that uh, he wanted to uh, divorce her. He uh, said that he would uh, leave her without any funds at all. Rather than wait for Boris to divorce her, prosecutors argued Elena decided to divorce him, so to speak. She decided that she was going to divorce him, but Russian style. And uh, that was with a pistol. The medical examiner testified that Boris Collegius was struck in the back of the head, fell to the floor, and was then in cold blood executed with one bullet to the temple. 
Prosecutors argued that Elena lured Boris to the basement of their Staten Island mansion and shot him. She was a cold-blooded murderess. As simple as that. The circumstantial evidence was strong, and it all centered around the trip to Disney World. The maid indicated to us that normally her days off uh, was Sunday, and that um, uh, prior to uh, leaving for Disney, uh, uh, Elena asked her to take Saturday off and come in Sunday, uh, which, she, which she never asked her to do before. She also uh, indicated when she got in the house on, on Sunday, there was a note uh, left for her um, to uh, clean up the basement, especially the, uh, the doors to the, um, to the boiler room. Just in time to clean up after a murder. According to the police, they found towels, sheets, and blankets in the mansion that matched the ones Boris's body was wrapped in. But there was no sign of blood anywhere. We conducted a, uh, extensive luminal tests of the walls, the doors. We were not able to come up with uh, any traces of blood. If Elena had killed Boris in the basement, surely there would have been a trace of blood somewhere. The prosecution claimed that they knew where the blood was. It was on a four by four piece of carpeting. The only problem was they didn't have it. Within two days after Boris was missing, and they installed new carpeting. They were supposed to have the old carpeting removed uh, from the premises. However, it was stored in the garage. Um, and later, the police found that carpeting um, with the four by four piece cut out. Even though the missing carpet was never found, the defense was willing to concede that Boris was killed in the basement. The question was, who killed him? The issue was not where was Boris Collegius killed. The issue was who killed him, not where or even how, who. It was a who question. Who fired that shot? Who put that bullet into the head of Boris Collegius? The frail, thin, innocent Elena? Or this cold, calculating, violent Messiah Justice? When he took the stand on day five of the trial, cold, calculating, violent Messiah didn't come across as all that cold or calculating. And he portrayed Elena as the violent one. He seemed to present himself um, quite well. I think he was just a, a regular guy that had some hard breaks in his life. He survived on the streets. He testified that she phoned him on the night of March 24th and begged him to come over. She brought him inside, showed him Boris's wrapped body in the basement, and told him to get rid of it. Elena's lawyers weren't buying Messiah's good Samaritan routine. Who was more likely the person to commit the crime? This. 100-pound, blonde-haired housewife who couldn't lift anything heavier than a grocery bag or Messiah Justice. And phone records showed Messiah never answered a call that night from the mansion as he claimed. Calls were made, but never answered. When it came time for closing arguments, the defense's main argument remained that the state was trying the wrong defendant. Instead of Elena in the dock, it should have been con artist gigolo messiah justice the defense put up mark fonti put up in the in the closing arguments that justice had had hidden in the basement waited for boris shot and killed him and then made phone calls from the basement to his cell phone and to his uh, home phone to kind of cover up as though she was calling him from the house uh you know say come come over and, and help me but with no murder weapon, no witnesses, and no forensic evidence, the trial ended pretty much as it began, with the question of whom to believe. Convinced the state had not proven their case, the defense elected not to put Elena on the stand. It was really a matter whether the jury believed him or not. And if they believed him, you know, you, you, convict, you convict her. If you don't believe him, you don't convict her. Closing arguments ended on June 25th. The jury took one hour and 20 minutes to return their verdict. They found Elena guilty. Guilty. God was like in a dream. Guilty. On September 24, 2002, Elena Kalichis was sentenced to 22 years to life for the murder of her husband, Boris. We as a society can accept certain crimes. Um, we're not so thrilled about them, but we can accept criminal behavior if it's justified, if it makes some sense. Like in a woman that was maybe beaten by her husband and then killed him, at least the jury can sort of make some sense out of that. But in a case where it's sort of a cold-blooded killing, especially by a woman, society has a really hard time taking that. 